Hello everyone, it's Ayer from Saturn's Edge, and you're watching more of Persona 3 Reload, episode 14! And uh, a while back I hit 10 subscribers, so, you know, milestones, uh, they, they've been happening, and are currently still happening. In today's episode, it's gonna be an hour-long episode of just battling. A lot of battling. We are gonna be learning about our new party member, Akihiko Sanada. And, uh, well, what it means for him to be on our team. Uh, wow, it is, um... I'm just tired Good. right now, honestly, that's that's pretty much Where it. My uh, my commentary might be very, uh... I don't know, boring, I guess? I don't know. Point is, I'm gonna be a bit, um, off today when it comes to recording. I do have an hour of footage to go through, so I'm gonna have to talk for an hour straight, which is... You know, something I've been getting used to, but eh, it sucks. I'm not exactly a fan of it. <laughs> oh, man. Man, what did I... I know for a fact that all of this is just battling. Like, literally all of this just battles all of it. We went from, yes, the 34... The 34th floor of Arca, and we're moving our way up. Okay, let's get to it. Uh, in the block. It's a... You know, it's been nice. I took a little bit of chill time between, uh, you know, whenever I made my last video and recording the footage for this one. Careful. And then I took the some nearby. more time between recording the footage and getting some audio ready, so this is the first uh, bit of audio for this episode, for this, you know, bunch of episodes, I should say. Right. Luckily, in this one we've got, uh, we've got a couple tough battles in this one, actually, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know what it is about this specific section, but, uh, it was tough. On the plus side, we got to learn more about what Akihiko can actually do. Akihiko is covering a skill set that I would have loved to have covered earlier, that not by our, uh, our main protagonist, Minato. He uses Zeo skills, which is absolutely amazing. And his melee attack is the strike, rather than a slash or a pierce. So... I consider that just a win, uh, as he is our third physical type, um, yeah, our third physical type, what do I say? Third physical attacking type, there we go, wow, I'm sorry, <laughs> man, I'm, I'm out of my loop, I'm out of my game, uh, here this morning, <laughs> morning, it's like 4pm, man, I need to get it together. I did not actually expect to get this right with, um, Mabufu. I kind of just assumed, because they were fire-based, I could use ice. My other guess was win. Uh... Oh, and I inflicted him with freeze. Nice. Ooh. But overall, Akihiko makes up for a lot of the weak- a lot of the areas that we've been weak in. Minato is meant to be a very all-around character. He's meant to cover the various types that we don't have access to in our main party. He has a lot of power behind him, if you could pull it off right, but he also equally has his main weaknesses. We have uh, Yukari, who acts as our wind specialist, but also our support by curing various ailments, and also by healing skills. And we have Junpei, who acts as kind of a weird mixed bag, where he's mostly a physical attacker. Um, even if he does have fire skills, he's mainly a physical attacker. Akihiko is especially a physical attacker, but he does have the ZO skills to back it up, so he has equal, like, not equal stats in strength and physical, but, like, he's more balanced than Junpei is, where Junpei, like, has a lot of physical stuff going on. It makes for a really nice blend. Also, I like the 1-2-3 hit combo. It's very, uh... It's very nice. It's a good sound, too. It's actually kind of satisfying to hear it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Akihiko, that took a while. Uh... Oh, man. Mm. I yawn there. That's not, uh... <laughs> That's not exactly professional. Mm. <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm, like, actually blanking here. Point is, uh... This one's a lot of battling. It's an hour's worth. We're already like four minutes, five minutes in. This one was actually a tough one uh, for me. Not to record it or like any physical things. It was like the actual battling portion of it. It was getting like kind of difficult. So I might spend some time 
in a different episode that's not a part of this bunch grinding up. And if I, you know, choose to spend that time, you know, grinding for, uh, uh, for level ups and for skills and such, and money, I mean, we need more money, <laughs> uh, that'd be a good way that we could do that. This is actually one of the times I've had problems with money in an RPG. Um, I remember playing Persona 5 Strikers, and I had an ungodly amount of money in that game. Like, I did not have to worry about, like, spending problems pretty much ever. But this, this game right here, and, like, every game, really, has not given me problems with currency at all. This is the one game where I actually struggle with finances, and I actually really... I'm not gonna say enjoy, but I do, like... I like that aspect of it, because it feels right, in a way. Like, it feels good to, like, struggle with a thing that isn't, like, turn-based combat or collecting things. It feels nice to actually struggle with, like, collecting currency to make yourself better at these things. I will admit this die, this die shadow, uh, what is it called? I, I literally pointed it out earlier. Yeah, the disturbing dice, there we go. Or, it's, it said, it says disturbing dice, but there's one die, clearly. So, I don't know, that's kind of a, just kind of a note. Anyway, I had a lot of trouble with this enemy because I could not figure out his weakness at all. Nothing, I had no idea. Um, although the free skill was definitely a good one to inflict, I'll say that. Um, but yeah, no, seriously, I had no idea what he was weak to. Not a single clue. I just, I don't know. I mean, like, resistant to fire, I can, I can maybe understand that, but like, I don't, I, I didn't figure out his weakness for quite a while, and that was kind of a shame. Also, he kept dodging attacks, too, because he buffed up the critical rate, and that was, like, a big deal. And don't get me wrong, I love critical rate up, but if it's done to me, then like, you know, the damage is being dealt to me, that's not a fun time. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't remember what he was actually weak to. Uh, huh. That's, uh, eh, maybe that's something I can look up in the future, who knows. On the plus side about today, it's not just going to be fighting, even though I said it would be. I do actually collect some personas, and I'm able to talk about those for a bit. Ah, uh, man. Let's see, um, this week, let's see, so this week. I'm thinking of a way to plan out my week before we actually, like, get into, like, some, uh, more busy stuff, I guess. But, uh, man, I don't, I don't know, um, hmm. Uh, let me think about that. Sorry it's, like, taking me a bit and I'm blanking on, like, pretty much everything. But, uh... The way that I want to plan out this week is that I have this episode releasing probably either tonight. So, like, Sunday night or Monday morning. And then... For my next episode, I do want to post it because it would be episode 15, I believe? Yeah, and that's kind of a milestone. I know that 10 is a milestone, but 15 is also equally as much as a milestone as, like, 5 is. Especially with how long I'm, like, attempting to do this. Um, let's see. Out of this batch of footage, I could easily do maybe three or four episodes. Um, hmm. I do want to do a speed paint this week at some point. Uh, and it's gonna take me a while to complete that, because usually... My drawing sessions are, like, I record it for, like, maybe two to three hours. And I take a break and then save the rest for the next day, and then that's another three-hour session. And I just do that until it's done. I then combine all the footage together and speed it up uh, to 16, like, time speed. But by doing that, with all that footage, that drops me down to, like, a 16-minute, like, to 20-minute um, runtime in the episode. Like, it's really, it's really fast. 16 times, in terms of speed, is insanely fast. Also, level up for everyone across the board, that's nice. So, I had a conversation with my friend about Akihiko, 
uh, specifically at the way that he pronounces his persona's name. Now, me and my friend both believe that it is a Greek name, because it is. It's an ancient Greek name. I'll explain the backstory of him in a minute. But we believe that he's pronounced Polidices. But Akihiko constantly proves us wrong by pronouncing it uh, Polydeuces. I just... man... You know, like that... It, it messes with me a little bit, because I don't know if I'm right or wrong. I really don't, and I'm never gonna know. Point is, uh... Polydeuces, or Polydeuces, or whatever you want to call him, has another name, uh, which is Pollux, or, uh, you know, in our case, Polydeuces, Polydeuces, whatever works. Pollux is also an acceptable name. And he is one part of a set of twin half-brothers in Greek and Roman mythology, his twin half-brother being Castor. Now, uh, let's see what we've got here. These twins are also known as Gemini, uh, so they're actually kind of a, they're, they're like the start of like how that Gemini constellation and the uh, astrology symbol, like they come from. They, they come from these two, uh, Castor and, well, we don't see that Pollux. Kind of I'll say Pollux Let's because that's a lot off. easier to say. Uh, they're sometimes both mortal and sometimes both divine. One consistent point that is only one of them is immortal, and it's Pollux. In Homer's The Iliad, uh, Helen looks down from the walls of Troy and wonders why she does not see her brothers among the, uh... Achaeans? Ach yeah, Achaeans, I think. I don't know. The narrator remarks that they are both already dead and buried back in their homeland of, uh... Oh my god, I can't pronounce any of these. Man, I'm, I'm out. I'm out of my game. Mm. Thus suggesting that at least in some early traditions, both were mortal. Uh, so Pollux and Castor were related to uh, Helen of Troy. Uh, point is, at one point they were both considered mortal, but now, in typical tellings of it, or uh, more common tellings of it, uh, Pollux is the one that is immortal rather than Castor. He is the one that would be mortal. I do like the idea that, uh, I mean, I like the source that came from, because I think later on we're gonna see, like, an expansion upon that. Uh, but, like, the main point of it that I really just enjoy is the, uh, Polydeuces, or Pollux design of the Persona. Uh, the design of the Persona is actually kind of interesting to me, as it's kind of like... He's kind of like a blue being, but like it's kind of like a giant suit of armor in a way, and he's wearing like ballistic armor. And on his right hand is kind of like this needle gun thing that could also count as like a spear part, I guess. Basically, it's more of a, stab uh, a stabbing implement than anything. Um, this could be a way that he channels electricity for the skills. That's pretty cool. Uh, he also has long blonde hair which is a really unique detail compared to most other personas that we've seen so far, considering that Hermes doesn't have hair, Io's hair defies gravity, or Eo's hair uh, defies gravity. And then we have, um, we have Orpheus, who... I'm, I'm saying starting persona-wise. Um, Orpheus does have hair, but it's very similar to the protagonist. Pollux, on the other hand, is not similar to... Uh, Akihiko in, like, appearance, and that's kind of interesting in a way. Yeah, there we go. Here's a more proper story. Uh, Castor and, uh, Castor and Pollux had the same mother, Leda, but, uh, Pollux's father was Zeus, while Castor's father was a mortal man named, uh, Tind Tindarius? Tindarius? Darius sounds right. Because this, Castor was mortal and, uh, po uh Pollux was immortal, uh, when Castor died, Pollux asked Zeus to let him share his own immortality with his twin to keep them together, and they were transformed into the Gemini constellation. There we go! Uh, they were both known as the Dioscuri, or Hero Twins. There we go. See, like, now, that makes me a lot happier in terms of where they come from, uh, and, like, more details about them. I do like that story a lot now, uh, reading on it. <laughs> You could tell that, um, 
Clearly, I'm not the best at pronunciations, because I'm, I'm not exactly, uh... <laughs> Simply put, I'm not exactly, uh, well-taught in a lot of cases. Like, pretty much the most education I have is high school education. But in American, like, especially Midwestern American, uh, high school education, especially from, like, a smaller town, it's not exactly great. <laughs> So we don't end up learning a lot. Um, in my case, I just didn't learn a lot in general. I just never actually learned anything. I just regurgitated what was told to me and managed to pass tests that way. Plus, I never took the initiative to actually look stuff up on my own unless it was something that absolutely interested me, like, for example, Persona or any other video game or just anything that was not school-related. Sometimes there'd be something that was school-related that I'd really look into. Uh, sometimes, but most of the time it was a no. Um, yeah. Uh, school, like, the education system for Americans, really, it just doesn't interest me in any way. There's no material there that's like... I'm not gonna say it's useless, because it isn't, but at the same time, none of it is absolutely, like, appealing in any way. None of it just stands out to me as something amazing, especially science. Science is kind of, like, boring to me. And I've made my rant on why science is just not fun. Oh, let's see, yeah. I've made that rant before, and, you know, I'm not gonna get into it again, because, frankly, that's not worth it at all. I had a lot of difficulty with this one, too. Actually, you could tell I didn't have a lot of difficulty with it, but with this enemy in particular, it was a tougher shadow, like, ones that we fought before. So it was hard to figure out what the weakness was, and it was hard to figure out, um, how to get around it, really. <laughs> Let's see, did I pick up anything? Yeah, I picked up uh, the Magician Arcana from this because I wanted those gems. And I wanted that first part of the Arcana Burst. And that got me a Steam Achievement, that's right. I have two Steam Achievements in this footage. So, uh, if you hear that noise, yeah. Because of the Steam Achievements, you could tell I'm playing for the first time and experiencing a lot of this, like, completely new and fresh to me. Typically with a playthrough, there's either two ways that it's done. There's the way that it's done where you play it for the first time and it's all fresh and new to you. But then there's also the second time, and the second time is after you played through the full game so you don't hear any of those Steam achievements. It's where you know everything about the game so you're able to go through it efficiently. It's... Uh, simply put, I didn't do a second playthrough of this, uh, and I don't... I, I'm gonna be real, I don't plan on doing a second playthrough of this ever. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of one and done with this, unless it, like, really strikes my fancy one day and I have to play it again. But then again, the intro is so long, I don't know why I would play it again. Oh, well, maybe I'd play it for the story, who knows. Or maybe I have to prove myself that I actually, like, played the game, so I'd have to, like, play the game more. I don't know. Or maybe I could do an expert mode run on this, but not, like, recording it, because doing a second thing of this would be... Doing a second recording of this, where it's the same stuff again, but me just explaining everything of, like, how I'm doing things. And, uh, I mean, that just doesn't sound fun at all. I've considered for a while after recording this that maybe I should speed through, like, battle encounters. Like, these basic floors, right? Maybe I should speed through them, you know? Like, unless I find something really cool or note something interesting or whatever, right? But I feel like that'd take away from a lot of what I'm experiencing, and I did want to do a proper playthrough of this, and a proper playthrough of this looks like a long play. I don't really speed through anything. Even if I have skipped maybe like one or two lines of dialogue every now and then, I have always taken the time to actually like record this and think about it and do the right things and such. Uh, but I haven't like sped up the footage, I haven't done anything that would be... Uh, I guess damaging to um, what I'm already doing. Uh, hmm. Mm, there we go. I think one thing that, um, man, one thing that I've looked at that I'm disappointed in is that I've learned that, like, the way that I'm doing this is not the typical way that people do things. Not the footage, not this gameplay, right? 
but rather YouTube. Where if you're, like, just starting out, a lot of people will actually buy views from, like, ViewBots and ViewFarm accounts to, like, get their numbers up and get more people to see their footage, uh, see their videos and such. Like, all of their content. But, to me, like, I looked at that and I'm just like, if that's how you have to start to be seen on a platform such as this, a platform that's, like, supposed to be open to a lot of different kinds of content, it's kind of scummy in a way. It makes it so that way, like, you have to pay to get your- you have to pay to earn your way up. And I just don't like that. Like, most of the stuff I'm doing here is free. Paying for the games makes sense. The recording software, free. The editing software, it's Microsoft Clipchamp. It's free. It's terrible, but it's free. And, like, to me, like, if I have to pay for views for then people to actually start seeing my content, and then the fake views go away over time and the real ones come back in, and my numbers are still low, because guess what? Everyone else is playing the game. Like, everyone else is playing and doing different things, then what was the point of even doing this in the first place, you know? I'm very much a person that believes that, like, I need to do something authentic. So that's why I'm very open about, like, who I am and, like, what my story is while I'm playing the game. Rather than, like, putting on, like, a fake personality that I kind of did at the start. At least with the personality at the start that I was putting on, it was to encourage me to actually, like, be more open. And more, uh, energetic in my, uh, in my videos. You can tell that now, currently, like today, I haven't been as energetic. Uh, mainly because I'm just tired. <laughs> but no, I do believe that I need to do things authentic. I don't want to put on a personality unless it's, like, kind of funny and there's a joke in it. I don't want to buy views to eventually get seen and then have an authentic pathway. I want to do things straight. I want to have things, like, straightforward, you know? I just... I don't like the idea that you have to... Pay for views, inflate your numbers, then get seen, and then your numbers look similar. That's kind of dumb. If someone wants to see something, they can see something, you know? Also, like, I understand that if you, like, if you type in the YouTube search bar, like, Persona 3 Reload, like, right? You're gonna see a couple things. You're gonna see the trailers, you're gonna see the most popular footage, like, gameplay-wise. You're gonna see some theories and such. Maybe, not, not theories, but, like, analysis. You're gonna see, like, analysis and, like, um, essay video type things. You're gonna see small clips on shorts. And that's it. Like, nobody at my level, like, this lower level, is gonna get noticed because that stuff's at the top. I'm not saying change it around for me. I'm just saying, like, if someone found me through that higher-up stuff, That'd be a th that'd be more authentic than buying views and looking like I was at the top. I'm just not a fan of that sort of thing, especially when you consider the fact that if I were to buy those views, right, those are going on arguably some of my better episodes. Like for example, the ones before, like uh, a couple of them before this, or maybe like the sixth or seventh episode. Those are good ones. But then it also goes on my worst ones, like one, two, eight. Eight was terrible. I think it was a point is, like, it applies to all my worst. And if I said I'm doing Persona, and that shows up on someone's feed, but what shows up is like the worst video they've seen, then what was the point? And I'm not gonna go back and re-record it. Like, I didn't know what I was doing, you know? Honestly, what would be interesting is if I did a, like, if I manage to keep the footage... Well, actually, I do, did manage to keep the footage, but I don't know if it pulled from the files still. I trashed those old files a long time ago. Hmm. Point is, I'd have to really go digging around for that footage. And... If I can't find that footage, that means I have to re-record it in three separate locations. Locations that are all of the early game. I'm not doing this again. That would suck. 
it's also kind of just meant to be like progression of how I'm doing these things, you know? If I if I take those down and show like a weird progression rather than a smoother like understanding progression of how I'm doing these, then it also doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh man, I am whew, tired. I really need to get a soda or something, man. I'm uh, not doing too great uh, in terms of staying awake. Actually, I think last night I pulled almost an all-nighter. Let's see, yeah, I, I stayed up till like 5 in the morning. I don't know why I did. Yeah, I don't know why I stayed up till 5 in the morning. I saw the sunrise and then went to bed. Like, I don't understand, I guess. Man, I'm like, I'm out of it a little bit. Um, let's see, slime, unicorn. Oh, Inugami! Man, I completely just missed over Inugami. And uh, potentially any other personas I may have tamed along the way. Um, Inugami is... Well, it's a very long dog looking thing. It's a possessing... Uh, let's see, hold on. <laughs> yep, they are literally a dog god. They're a type of yokai in Japanese mythology. They resemble and usually originate from a dog. Uh, sometimes, other species like wolves, raccoons, and weasels. Uh, most commonly carrying out vengeance or acting as guardians on behalf of their Inugami owner. They are also occasionally summoned by on Onyoji at, uh, to do their will. Ooh, am I- did I pick up Archangel? I think I did. Yeah, I did pick up Archangel. Oh, well, now we're gonna have to go to Archangel really quick. Archangel is, simply put, a knight, an, like an angel, basically. Just your typical knightly angel. They're among the eighth sphere, making them second in the third hierarchy in the nine orders of angels in Christian teachings. Archangels are one of the few bodies of angels that contact those on the material uh, plane directly, and are the ministers and messengers between God and mankind. Yes, you did hear a Steam achievement. There is a dispute on whether famous archangels such as Michael and Gabriel are in the same class as the plain archangels, who are in the uh, who in the Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah, and in the Bible are uh, called Beni, oh yeah, uh, Beni Elohim, uh, meaning children of God or belong to a completely different order known as the Rav Malakim, or uh, Malakim Panav, who are the angels that stand before the Lord himself. According to some texts, archangels are also uh, the primary warrior race of angels and are known to be at constant war with the fallen angels. It is even suggested that Lucifer was an archangel before his fall from grace. You could tell that from the archangel design, he very much uh, represents a knight uh, in armor and with a sword. I do like that because, you know, God is also known as the Lord, which is very similar to, like, not similar, but the name is similar to, like, what a king would be called, like, Lord someone. And then having the archangels act as knights, which is true for their, th uh, their mythos, not mythos, true for their story, I should say. And then to add on to that by adding, like, more knightly motifs, having them be under the Lord. That's how you do it. That's a good example of, like, design and such. Um, I will say that pretty much every Persona design in this, in this series, I'm gonna say pretty much, okay? Because I'm not exactly, uh, not exactly okay with a couple of them. Uh, honestly, I don't think I'm ever going to be okay with a couple of them. But pretty much every, uh, Persona design in here either makes sense and is very fitting, or it's actually pretty good, even if it isn't, like, absolutely perfect and down to a T. And I'll admit, I love the shadow designs. I love, like, some of the various, like, kind of awkward-looking characters. The eagles are a prime example. Like, I just like the heart, like, cushion things in the back. I love the phantom mages with, like, the, like, the cage that has the fire in it. And, like, I just love the longer, like, slimmer, like, pointy limbs. It's pretty cool to look at, really. I'll admit, Slime isn't really anything uh, special at all in terms of design, but I'm still okay with him. Uh, he is not one that, like, I hate. 
If I had to point out one I hated, it'd be a lot farther down the list. Uh, down the list of personas that we're gonna encounter in this game. <laughs> Now, what I'm doing uh, when I when I got Inugami and then immediately replaced him with Archangel, uh, why I did that was simply because I learned that all you have to do is pick up the Persona for it to be registered in the Compendium. You don't have to level them up, you don't have to do any battle with them. You just have to collect them one time. Counter is a useful skill. 10% chance of reflecting physical skills. That is a passive skill, which is a new kind of skill that we're getting used to that works in a variety of ways. Counter, for Junpei specifically, is that 10% reflecting of uh, physical skills. So any pierce, any, uh, yeah, pierce, strike, and slashing damage has a 10% chance of getting sent back. But magical damage does not get sent back at all. Oh yeah, I managed to figure out what the tower was weak to. It's electricity. Who knew? Yeah, there we go. Actually, um, let's see. Yeah, but I learned that all you have to do is collect them, and then they're gonna show up in the compendium. And they're collected, technically. So, what I'm doing more often is collecting them, like, immediately, right? Like, I don't need to have a free slot or anything, I just need to constantly cover up the previous one that I'm not going to use. Hmm. Hmm. There we go. Ooh, man. I had to, like, pop my arm there for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, man, 30 minutes into this footage, and we still got half of the episode to go. Man, we've, we've got a while. Uh, hmm. I'm sorry, again, for being a little bit, like, off today. I'll probably be back into it tomorrow. Maybe I'm, like, a little bit just off in general. Maybe I'm, like, sick or something. I don't know. I certainly hope I'm not sick and I'm just tired because I've got work tomorrow and I would prefer to go to work than to stay at home. I really want to get paid. <laughs> mm. Um, yeah, the Soul Dancer design I really like. Uh, I, I just like some shadow designs in general. The Soul Dancer is one of them. I love the Soul Dancer design. Oh, for the primary, uh, for the most part, let's see, Akihiko, you've noticed that he punches, he strikes. Yeah, his main form of attacking his weapon is gloves, so boxing gloves, um, what are those things called? Brass knuckles, like anything that goes on the fist. And it ties, it doesn't tie really well, it literally is the case of he is a trained boxer, so it's the thing he would 100% use. He is a part of the boxing club, it's only natural that he would know, one, how to box, but two, how to, like, not how to, that his preferred fighting style is boxing. Like, it's just a given. It's kind of like how Junpei uh, swings his claymores like a bat, and he kind of has a baseball motif going on. Or how Yukari's literally a part of the archery club, and therefore uses a bow. Like, it's the same stuff. Hmm. I really do want to buff up my uh, evasion, like my shoes, at some point. I would really love to do that. Like, just upgrade the shoes, just in general. That'd be nice. Um, hmm. I'm just trying to think about what else to talk about today, because, like, I don't know what to talk about exactly. It's just taken me a while to, like, really think about what to talk about, and it's... It's whatever, you know? Hmm. I don't know what I'm gonna do for my speed paint later. I really don't know. Um... I have so many different ideas that I want to try. Like, I could reveal what some of my personal projects are, and some of my, like, original characters for those projects. But it's also a bit too early to talk about anything, because I haven't, like done enough work to the point where I'm comfortable with um, sharing it or posting it yet. And by that I mean like, I've got a plot line like somewhat figured out, but I'd prefer to like actually write the whole story. You know? Uh, it'd take me a while to really do that. Um, 
I could do a piece of fan art for anything, really, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not great at fan art. Uh, I've done that, I've done that before, and that's, um, it's not perfect. Um, I'm trying to think about what else there is that I could do. Um, I could finally draw my, my YouTube profile picture, or, like, an intro, like, animation, or the credits. Not credits, but, like, the ending. Okay. Let's keep on exploring. I do need to ask about some permissions on that, though. Um, I've just got to, like, cover some things with a friend if I want to do that. Because uh, I have an idea for... I have an idea for, like, a basic intro. And, like, a basic, um, like, ending card, I guess. But I can't guarantee anything because, you know... That idea is not solid. It, uh, it, it, I just need to talk to someone about that in order to figure things out. Mm -hmm. But no, the YouTube profile picture could definitely be one for the list. Um, because I definitely have not made that at all. I really should. Because, <laughs> uh, you know. Oh, there we go, Chimera. That's a new persona. Another thing to talk about. I'm like barely going along with things. I'm so out of it, so when something new pops up, I can immediately talk about it. I'm pretty sure we've all heard of a chimera, but they come from Greek and Ro uh, Roman mythology, for the most part. I just hit my keyboard on accident. <laughs> a chimera is the monster offspring of Typhon and Echidna from uh, Greek mythology, and is the sibling of Cerberus and Orthrus. This monster breathes fire and is made up of parts from different animals, the general ones being the body and head of a lion, with the goat's head spout uh, sprouting in the middle, and a snake's head for a tail. Other accounts include the chimera being a three-headed animal, with a dragon being the third head rather than, uh, well, not rather than something, but I think that a good replacement for the snake would be the dragon. That makes sense to me. Uh, but yeah, overall, a Chimera is not... The Chimera is not really an interesting, uh, piece of mythos. Not compared to, like, something like, uh, I don't know, Hermes, or, uh, Eo, or Orpheus. A Chimera is kind of just like a basic beast when it comes to, uh, like, mythology. It's kind of like how the yokai... Mm. It's kind of like how the yokai are interesting in the sense that, like, oh yeah, I'm not from Japan, that's cool, like, that's a pretty cool piece, uh, to learn. But if you're from Japan, like, the yokai probably aren't the coolest part, and the coolest part is learning about the different mythologies from, like, other countries and various other, um, pop cultures. Like, for example, the slime being from Dungeons & Dragons, or, uh, like, the chimera being from, uh, the chimera being from Greek and Roman mythology. In my case, it's not as interesting, because, like, we grew up, uh, taught at school, like, about, like, Greek and Roman mythology, and, like, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, and, like, all the empires and stuff. So, like, automatically to me, I guess, um, I guess I'm just not as interested in Greek mythology as other people are. I am really not. Uh, Honestly, I'm way more interested in pop culture than I am mythology. Like, that's that's just the case. And I'm talking pop culture as in, like, really just any piece of pop culture from either, like, the last, I don't know, 50 years or so? I don't know. Point is, pop culture is what I aim in and it's what, I'm, what I excel in. I especially love modern pop culture as it's a lot to really work with. And that's another Arcana Burst! Amazing. Now everything's at stage four. Ooh, money, vacuum slash, 50% HP, or EXP will increase. I think I went with EXP will increase, because I think that's just natural. Yeah, there we go, I did go with that. That's good. How much XP did that give me? I think it was like 2,000? No, not 2,462. That is such a shame. Only 462 XP. That is like, literally terrible. Man. Maybe I was over-leveled or something, I don't know. Maybe I just need a more difficult fight. Doesn't that one look pretty tough? Yeah, it does look pretty tough. <laughs> I just like following up random comments with my own comments because it's just like something stupid to think about. Uh, wow. 20 minutes left in this video. Man, we have got a long way to go. 
Mm. Man. I really need to, like, drink something before I record these, because I I've yawned more in this video than I have any of my other videos. Which, the record is, like, zero. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, I wanted to do fire skills, because, uh, this enemy specifically is weak to fire. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Mm. Wow, like, I'm blanking. Oh, wait a minute! I know something cool I can actually talk about, because I'm not, like, completely out of it yet. If I just keep talking, then, like, clearly I'm gonna stay awake. So, I just... I didn't just remember this, it's just, like, it's something I was, I'm willing to bring up here, um, just for fun. So two years ago, I paid into a little Kickstarter, uh, two whole years ago, okay? You may have heard of this, uh, Kickstarter, you may have heard of what the project is for, um, you know, Friday Night Funkin'. Oh my god, I'm sorry. But no, I paid into the Friday Night Funkin' Kickstarter, uh, two years ago. And I paid for, like, the digital copy, and I also paid for the cassette, the vinyl, and the CD for the soundtrack. Because I, first off, CDs are cool. I like CDs. I can play them in my car, I don't have to worry about anything, you know. If my phone battery dies, I can throw the CD in. And then, you know, a vinyl is really cool, and a cassette to me is, like, extremely cool. Like, vinyls and cassette. Not vinyls. Vinyl is already plural. Sorry. But yeah, no, vinyl uh, records and cassettes are really cool to me. My dad was, uh, he is big on music, so he has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of records, he has a lot of cassettes, he has a lot of CDs. He's a very big music guy. He loves music. So I grew up surrounded by this stuff. I never really had it for, like, myself, because I didn't quite understand it, and frankly, I never had a job until I was, like, I don't know, 13 or something. Point is, I didn't really get into it at first. But with these, I was like, you know what, I'll get into it. I'll actually get, you know, a, uh, I'll actually get, <laughs> ooh, I'll actually get a cassette and a vinyl. I already had a couple vinyls. Ugh, I did it again, I'm sorry. I already had a couple records uh, before that point. Um, wait, what persona did I just collect? Uh... Okay, we'll we'll figure it out. Wait, was that actually the one? Did I pull up the right one? Careful. There's no way I pulled up the right one. Okay, I did pull up the right one. It's Nigi Mitama. Really quick, we're gonna do a quick stop in my story, and we're gonna talk about Nigi Mitama. Nigi Mitama is the other part of the uh, the opposite of Ara Mitama, that one like angry uh, Japanese spirit we got before. In Japanese belief, Nigi Mitama is the calm and functional state of a person's soul, or kami, which is considered to be the opposite of the Ara Mitama. The Ara Mitama must first be pacified with rites and worship before the Nigi Mitama will appear. This is cool, because the Nigi Mitama is the one you get first, and then, uh, not the, yeah, the Ara is what you get first, then you get Nigi. That's awesome! That's a good, like, function to it. They actually had it, like, planned out in a flow. They did not put it the wrong way around. I respect that. I'm also using Speed Incense to buff up Junpei, just a little bit. Uh, and then I didn't know I had three, so I just used one for Yukari, Junpei, and for Akihiko. It just made sense to me. Anyway, back to the story uh, that I was getting to. So, I paid in that Kickstarter two years ago. It was like uh, 60 bucks at the time, I think. 60, 60 dollars, okay? Now, this Kickstarter raised, like, two million dollars, it had a ton of people behind it, and we need to note that at that time, it was post-COVID. During and post-COVID, right. there was an extreme so uh, shortage of different supplies. Uh, this included manga, this included uh, vinyl, this included uh, CDs, cassettes. Basically anything, even bicycles, were at, like, a, like at a serious risk, okay? I have to do this. Everything was pretty much, like, just okay. difficult to get your hands on. Uh, because of printing issues, mainly. They couldn't produce enough of these because nobody was at work. You know, nobody was actually going to work. Uh, mainly because of COVID. Now, I understand that, and, you know, I waited. Uh, in the first year, I waited, I was like, okay, 
it should be over now. They should be able to get me my things, right? But then, I thought about it with how many people ordered. There's got to be a backlog, right? And I was right, because just a couple days ago, I finally got it. I finally got the stuff from the Kickstarter. Sadly, not the digital key to the game, because that game's not even close to out yet. Whenever it does, they're probably gonna email me my key or something. You know, it's naturally how it'd work, in my opinion. Uh, but I do have my names in the credits, so that's, you know, I do have my name in the credits, that's gonna be nice. Point is, they sent it to me, right? I actually had difficulty with this boss fight, give me a minute. So, I, I ordered it two years ago, but at that time, I was living in a different house, and I thought I'd change the address. So, it sent to my old address. I've moved twice. Uh, so, it sent it to my old address from two houses ago. I had to, like, call up the post office and ask about it. Uh, I had to get my dad, like, to deliver it for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a complete, like, man, it was like... I'm not gonna say it was, like, a pain in the ass. It was more of a small inconvenience, if anything. Especially when it's just, like, they, they, they email me one day saying, like, uh, Needle Juice Records, that's the, that's the company. They're just like, yeah, so, we sent your stuff, and it's delivered already. Like, they didn't give me a heads up ahead of time. They didn't give me anything. They just said, it's delivered. Like, that doesn't give me a lot of context for what I'm working with. In fact, I forgot what I ordered. Uh, and so... I had to, like, look it up really quick to figure out what I actually ordered. So, finally, I get it in last night. And last night, I gotta say, that's worth the two-year wait. It, it really was. For $60, it's not worth the wait time. It's more worth the price. But, you know... If we weren't dealing with printing problems, it would have been out in, like, a few months. Like, easily it would have been out, I don't know, maybe half a year to a year, you know? I understand completely what the situation was. But no, actually, it was pretty cool. I got... the, the cassette looks cool, it's a nice blue color, there's cool art for, like, the little, like, uh, like, paper in the front of it. And on the actual cassette itself, on the vinyl, like... There's a cool color to it. It's like a black and gray with a blue splash in the middle. Uh, the art on, like, the inside and outside cover of the vinyl. Like, the actual, like... <laughs> it looks cool. And then the CD. Uh, the CD had, like, the CD booklet, and that had all this unique art in it, and I loved it. And then, they sent me two digital download codes. Uh, I don't know why they sent me two, but I could probably share one with a friend. And then, to add on to that, uh, like, I noticed that on, like, a lot of the stuff, like, where it says, like, all rights reserved, they put in these, like, little joke lines that are just, like, they're actually really funny. Uh, they really are. Um, it's very Newgrounds era humor. I, I do enjoy it. I'm sorry for talking about that, but, like, it's something to talk about. It passes the time that I'm spending recording this video, and frankly, it's, like, a nice little story. And it shows that, like, it shows that, honestly, I do actually pay attention to Kickstarters and such. Uh, I should probably pay attention to Kickstarters more and know, like, be interested in various things if something is getting a Kickstarter for it. I definitely want to pay into more Kickstarters at some point because those are actually pretty cool. Um, yeah. Anyway, this fight right here, this is why I was challenged. This is a genuinely challenging fight, especially for the level I'm at. This thing, this clairvoyant relic, has no weaknesses. Nothing. It is only weak to some ailments. It's only able to be afflicted by them. You need to use stat buffs and debuffs in this fight, or you're going to lose. You need to have good SP counts. You need to heal consistently. And you need to do good damage that has a high chance of getting a critical hit. So magic attacks are basically useless, but support uh, skills like healing or buffs or debuffs are completely on the table. 
Especially when this thing knows your weaknesses. It's actually really challenging. Guess what the doctor ordered. Also, sometimes it's hard to do consistent damage to it, because you don't know, like, what's weaker and what's stronger. So it's like, it's a really good challenge here. It actually, like... This fight... I'm not mad at this fight. I love this fight. Genuinely. It was a good challenge, but I will admit, it did disturb my pacing a little bit when I was playing through. Because usually the pacing is find the weakness and then kill it, you know? Because it has no weakness, because of its high health and, like, defense count, because of its knowledge of your weakness, because of everything, like, all these circumstances. This thing threw off my pacing and actually made me realize, oh damn, I need to actually think. I respect when a fight is like that, where it immediately, like, takes away your comfort and immediately puts you on edge of trying to get you to play the game, like, the way that it wants you to. And, you know, I thought Mitsuru's tip about, like, buffs and debuffs, like, when we got into this area... I thought it was just a nothing burger. I thought it meant nothing. I thought it was just like, oh yeah, here's a fact you already know. No, you have to use buffs and debuffs in this fight you're, if you're at a low level. You 100% have to. Also, I swear, this boss has something... The, this floor boss, I should say, has something against Yukari, because Yukari died like three times in this fight. It's actually pretty funny to me. I'm sorry, Yukari, you died three times, that's not on me. <laughs> it was also tough because if your protagonist dies, uh, you have to, like, it, it's like a game over, basically. So, it was all about, like, trying to make sure that the protagonist stayed up. This Sonic Punch right here, I think. Yes, because it did a critical and then we were able to do an all-out attack. That Sonic Punch just saved our run. That's what it did. That was such a good one. And then, who attacked next? I mean, yeah, Junpei, he did. What did he do? Power Slash? Yeah, he did. And that ended the fight. But that was incredibly tough. It really was. 4,950 XP. Everyone got a level up there. So my stats went up. Uh, Yukari got Sukunda, which is lowering one foe's evasion and accuracy, which is really good. And Shock Boost, which inc uh, increases the chances of the shock effect happening. Which is especially good, especially for, uh, for Akihiko. I swear, that skill is going to be, like, our saving grace, really. It's important that you inflict status effects sometimes, like shock, or like poison, or really anything that isn't rage. <laughs> uh, pretty much anything that isn't rage and you're good to go. <laughs> hmm. Ooh, man. Only, uh, ten minutes left in this video. I spent these last 10 minutes just finishing up this floor, and then uh, we, we did our little, like, Persona, uh, like, Velvet Room exchange. I just looked through everything at the Velvet Room and got to check stuff out. Oh, and we got an introduction to costumes. We got the Tuxedo, which uh, I decided to check who the Tuxedo belongs to, right? And I was surprised it didn't, it didn't belong to any, like, the, you know, just, like, the main character, or, like, Akihiko, because it made sense. No, it belongs to Junpei. And it puts him in a butler suit. He's the only one with this tuxedo, apparently. It's a little ridiculous, if I'm being honest. I actually equipped it for a little bit, and, uh... You can see here that he has, like, a top hat, the whole, like, coat, everything. I mean, it's kind of funny. I still don't know why they put him, they, he was the only one with the tuxedo. Maybe I'm gonna unlock more costumes later and more people are gonna have like more fancy costumes. I did unequip it from him like a little bit later because the costumes only really ever show up in Tartarist and I don't, I, I like their original like outfits, you know? I'm not really a, a the special kind of outfit guy. I will say though the DLC outfits right. are pretty all right. Um, 
I'll show those off at some point, but oh, I think that's gonna have to be at a time when I can actually explain more about Persona, because I'd be spoiling so many details. It'd probably come from, like, later games and such. Are you accepting a request? Let's hear the results. God, later games. I'm Let's not playing another Persona game back-to-back -back with this one. I would 100% love to play Bug Snacks right now. Like, I just need a chill game that's a lot smaller. Uh, so that way I don't have to, like, do this again. <laughs> very well. Persona was a very big task in terms of, uh, playing a game for the first time and recording it for a YouTube series. Man, I, uh... I don't regret it, but I do recognize that, like, this was way too ambitious. This was, uh... Man. <laughs> Welcome to the Velvet Room. Okay, Fuse Personas. Let's see what we got. What do we got? Oh, you have to register everything. That's Registering, right. Registering, I see. Will you register it to the Compendium? Yes, I will register it to the Compendium. What Please, did I do here? Yeah, I went by level. There we go. Yeah, so I had pretty much all of that filled out, uh, except for between, like, the 13 and 14 area. But, like, yeah, I was actually able to fill out, like, a lot of the stuff at the bottom, which was really nice. I was actually glad I could actually do that. Um, what did I fuse? I fused... let's see. Ooh, man. It's actually tough figuring out what I did and didn't fuse, because I know I fused one in particular. This would be a wise choice. Pretty sure I did... yep. What do you wish to inherit? Unless I backed out of them really quick. This would be a please choose what skills to inherit. There he is. Okay. Perfect. I think I 100% actually got him. It no, don't do that. There we go. Some power. God, I wish fandom didn't exist. Fandom.com is like literally the worst. It's so many ads. It doesn't make any sense. A new power emerges. Anyway, this is Oberon, uh, the king of the Fae and husband to, uh, 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 yeah, to Tanya, or, Ma or Mab. I personally prefer the line from uh, Sword Art Online, where it's, uh, like, the abridged one, where uh, the dude says Oberon, and uh, Asuna immediately follows it up with, It's Oberon. <laughs> you know, it rhymes with moron. <laughs> I love that line. I love Sword Art Online Abridged. It's great. Anyway, yeah. He is the Fairy King. Uh, Really, that's it. He's the Fairy King. There is a lot of story behind him, though. Uh, Let's see. Here he is. Some depictions say he is in charge of only the Seelie Court, but other depictions make him the leader of the entire Fairyland. Although he has the face of a handsome young man, a curse has made him no taller than a young child that he received shortly after birth. However, the curse gives him eternal beauty. Oberon is described as a benevolent being by the Fae, although others state that he is quite malicious when a certain incident affects the well-being of his kingdom and people. He is polite and sometimes even friendly towards humans, however he can be a selfish, short-tempered ruler, often falling in love and flirting with human women, only to be restra restrained by his, cons uh, by his consort Mab. Uh, Mab, sorry. Or Titania. I should say Titania. It is said that when Oberon is angry, his rage affects the very weather and causes nature to fall into discord, and the two are said to have once lived in India, and they would uh, cross the sea to Europe at night to dance in the moonlight. Uh, he became known from Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and the French epic uh, Juan of Bordeaux. Or Huon? I don't know. Uh, said to be the son of Morgan Le Fay and Julius Caesar. Believed to... Uh, been born sometime after Caesar's defeat in uh, Pompey. This here, this one I made, is Barith. I'm really going through the full list here. Barith. There we go, there he is. Uh, he's from Abrahamic mythology, or Goetia demons. Uh, Barith is... there we go. According to the writers of the, in the Lesser Key of Solomon, Barith is the 28th demonic spirit listed in the Arj Goetia. He is a great duke of hell with 26 legions of demons under his command. He is depicted as a knight or soldier wearing red armor and a golden crown. According to other grimoires, his skin is also red. He rides a gigantic red horse and burns those without manners. 
In order to speak with him, the Conjurer must wear a silver ring and hold it before their face. He gives true answers to all things past, present, and future as long as he is asked. But when not answering questions, he is a liar. He could turn any metal into gold, give dignities, and confirm them. As an angel, Barith was prince of the Order of the Cherubim. As a demon, he serves as a master of ceremonies, duke and grand pontiff in hell, and notarizes pacts with the devil. What? Uh, Barith was important to some alchemists who believed he had the power to transmute all base metals into gold. He was tricky to conjure, however, and had to be summoned with magic rings bearing his seal. He was known for making great promises, but also for being a great liar. In Michaelis, uh, in Michaelis' classi uh, classification of demons, he tempts people with murder, contention, strife, and blasphemy, and his adversary is Saint Barnabas. Uh, Barith may be derived from Baal Barith, a... Uh, God worshipped in Canaan uh, before he came to be viewed as a demon under Christian uh, demonology. So yes, now we have an actual, like, proper demon, even if... We already had Lilim. We already had Lilim. So now we have, like, a demon again. Who else did I fuse? Did I fuse anyone else? No, I was checking stats and types and stuff. So I had to, like, uh, hire... Not hire, but summon someone just in case. Yeah, but Oberon is a very welcome addition to the team, and Barith as well, because Barith uh, takes up a physical skill slot role that I really needed. <laughs> oh man, what a time. Oh, I've got, let's see, about two minutes left in this episode. Great. Uh, yeah, that's... Man, I really did make it through this full episode, surprisingly. I'm surprised I didn't pass out midway through and leave this thing recording and have to record all of this all over again. This persona is powerful. This persona is powerful. So many personas. There really are. It's awesome. I love it. But yeah, that's that's done. That's it for the summoning part of things. I guess, uh, you know, I spend the next uh, over a minute and a half just closing out everything and checking through things and making sure of stuff. When we get to Tartarus during the dark hour, you note that uh, Junpei is still wearing his butler outfit. Because Tartarus, whenever you're adventuring in it, it counts all of the dark hour as to when they can wear this costume. Are you accepting a oh, I actually managed to do that. How? Yeah, as long as I had the Oberon with a certain skill, they would give me that. What she just, what Elizabeth just gave me, is winter uniforms for the female members of our team. This only includes Yukari right now. So we do have her school uniform for when it's winter. There we go. Now we got Junpei back to the way he was. Alright, good. Uh, I guess I can start my closing ceremony of sorts here. Yes. Um, overall, I mean, today's episode wasn't great. It's very long. <laughs> I, uh, I talked for a decent amount of it. I'm not gonna say it was bad. But, um, yeah. I guess, uh... Well, I don't know what else to say, really. I mean, we're just calling it quits here. Overall, next episode is going to be a bit shorter and not based on combat and not going to be an absolute drag to go through, but hey, it'll be worth it. Um, I guess all I got to say for now is that, uh, well... I mean, I hope y'all have, like, a great day or a great week or however long it takes for me to upload things. Just expect something in the future. I'm hoping it's the speed paint and maybe the next episode, which will be episode 15. I'm Meyer. this has been Saturn's Edge with Persona 3 Reload, and, uh, I'm signing out. I'll, uh, see you all around. Just take it easy, okay? Bye.